Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here, and we are starting our year off with Calculus AB with this idea of the limit, and particularly in this video, finding a limit both numerically and graphically. And if you're watching this video, it's probably likely that you're new to AP Calculus and that uh, the idea of limit might be something that's a little strange to you. It is a very bizarre, abstract idea but it's a very important idea to sort of develop the ideas of calculus and later uh, tell you kind of where they're all headed. So we'll, we'll kind of introduce this a little bit and we'll, we'll attach a, a technology component by way of the TI Inspire calculator uh, to sort of help you understand a little bit about what a limit is. And that's where I'd like to kind of begin. I'd like to begin with the question, well, what really is a limit? And there are many definitions. Uh, there's very formal, complicated ones, and there are somewhat convoluted uh, sort of examples that relate it to something a little bit more tangible. And that's what I'm going to try to do with this. And I always like to tell my students that you want to think of a limit as being a journey and, and not necessarily a, a destination. And I know that might sound very, very cliche right now, but uh, I think as you start to see some of these examples, it will make more and more sense as time goes on. So what do I mean by this idea of limit? Well, let's take a look at a picture here. Let's say that we have a person and we have a wall. And this person here is going to move in such a way that he gets closer and closer to this wall. But I don't want him to just move in, in any sort of random fashion. I have very specific rules for the way that he shall move. So I want this person to move half the distance to the wall that he currently is at for each section, for each, I'm sorry, for each second that goes by. So for example, say initially he is this far from the wall. After the first second, he's going to close that distance in half. So he's now this distance from the wall after second one. Hopefully that makes sense. Another second goes by, and half of this distance here is going to be covered by his movement. So he's going to be, oh, right about at that location. After the next second, he's half as close to the wall again. After the next second, half as close to the wall again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we ask ourselves the question, if this continues on forever and ever, will the man's hand ever touch the wall? And the answer to that question is no. Technically, his hand will never reach the wall. He will continually get closer and closer to the wall, but he'll never touch it. And I know that's a very abstract idea, but that's what I mean by the idea of a limit being not necessarily the destination, but sort of the, the journey and, and where you end up sort of in relation to that ultimate destination. So let's look at uh, sort of an activity here in, the, in my notes for my class that will um, help you perhaps understand the idea of limit a little bit better. First of all, we're going to consider a function. And this function, um, I will admit, is a rather unusual function. It's the f of x equaling x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1. Now notice I have this bit of a disclaimer here that says, well, wait a minute, x can't be 1. That's there just sort of to make me not look like an idiot, that I, I know better that the fact that one cannot be a member of the domain of this function, and I hope that, that, that you guys that are watching the video can see that that would co cause some problems in the denominator. So um, kind of keep that in mind. Now, I have a question that I'm going to ask, and that question is what I'm highlighting down here in green. What is f of x approaching as x approaches 1? It's a very wordy question, but it's one that's definitely worth investigating. So it says, let's use our fingers and trace along the graph on both sides of one, and maybe we could figure out what this is doing. Okay, well, let's say that our left finger along the graph starts somewhere over in this region. Now, notice I'm, I'm letting x get closer and closer to one. See, x is negative one now, x is positive, or I'm sorry, x is zero. And then now x is getting closer and closer to positive 1. The question is, what does the y value become? 
But you notice that there's a different way, another way to approach one. Obviously, we could do so from the other side. And as x gets closer to one from that side, we're kind of moving in that fashion. Let's see if I can make that a little bit better. So once again, what, what is the y value becoming? And, and it's quite possible that you're sitting there and you're thinking about this and you have an answer in your head, and that's fantastic. We'll reveal that answer here in just a little bit. But I may have a, a, a slightly more intriguing and more concrete way that you can feel more comfortable about your answer. Now, let's revisit this idea up here, what I highlighted in green. A lot of times in mathematics, many, many words can be replaced by just few mathematic symbols. And that is exactly what's going on here with this statement that I'm out now highlighting in green. What I've got highlighted in green, both up here and down here, are the exact same thing. Right? It's just a different mathematical notation down below. This is saying, what is the limit of this function as the x value approaches 1? So how can we find that in a little bit of a different fashion? Well, enter the good old t-chart. And I know that uh, you've probably made many t-charts in your lives for various things in mathematics. And they do sort of serve a purpose in finding a limit. So you'll notice that this particular t-chart's been somewhat constructed for us in terms of the x values. Now you might think, hmm, I wonder why they chose these x values. I wouldn't worry so much about that right now. But notice that 1 seems to be our destination, so we thought best maybe that we put 1 smack dab in the middle. But why did we use 0.99 and 1.001? Well, the fact is, I could have used any values that I wanted to. I decided to use something that's fairly close to 1, but not so ridiculously close that I would have to put, you know, decimal place after decimal place after decimal place. So you'll notice that I used a value that was a thousandth away, whether it's by addition or subtraction from my target of 1. And as I continue to move farther out from 1, I have values that are a hundredth on either side, and then I've got values that are tenth out. Now, most of the problems that you'll initially discover in, in, in some of your exercises with, with limits and, and, and finding them numerically um, will already have these <coughs> particular uh, numbers entered into your t-chart x columns. But as you progress through these problems, you're going to sort of get uh, a little bit more freedom for you to put your own values of x. And I think if you follow this sort of philosophy here, you'll be able to um, answer the questions pretty effectively. All right, so let's go ahead and, and basically plug and chug. I mean, that's what we're going to do. We're going to take each one of these values and we're going to plug them in for the x's into that function. And if you're sitting there thinking, oh, we, we better get to use a calculator for that, well, you're exactly right. I would never dream of a student doing this without a calculator. So we'll go over to the TI Inspire calculator here. And uh, we are using the CX model. Um, and I want to tell uh, my students, if you're watching this particular video, on your note packet, uh, <clears throat> about halfway down the page, you have a little box that's called Quick TI Inspire Tutorial. Um, and that works wonderfully. You can follow that particular method. I'm going to deviate just a little bit from that method um, for, a, for a particular reason um, that you'll see here in just a little bit. But they're going to be somewhat similar. Uh, the big difference is, um, as I want us to use a document, I don't want to use a scratch pad. So what you want to do is make sure that you're in the home screen. And then let's go ahead and choose. Um, we can either choose a new document and then choose a graph. Or we can just grab this nice little handy icon down here, click on that. You can get to that by hitting tab several times. Um, and it tabs through all the options if you don't like to use the, the touch pad. So nonetheless, we use the graph. And we're going to enter this function. Notice that this function happens to be a fraction. So I'll hit Control Divide to bring up my fraction template. And then I'll enter x cubed, x to the power 3. Now, anytime that you use this exponent button, you're going to have to get out of the exponent by hitting the right arrow so that you can continue typing the rest of your function. So there's my numerator. And 
x minus 1 would be my denominator. Now we can just hit enter. And if you don't like the location of the f1 of x label, you can easily move it. Uh, what you would have to do, it's hard to demonstrate this uh, with the computer here, but while you've got your open hand on the um, particular label, in the middle, and I'll move my cursor over here to show you, but in the middle of your touchpad, you would then hold that, that button just for just a couple of seconds, and that would cause the hand to close at which point you can move by moving your finger across that touchpad so you can get him sort of out of the way. And I'm going to do something else here. Um, I really like the grid line feature with the calculator. So while I'm in this graphing screen, I can hit menu and bring up the graphing screen menu items. And the one that I like here is view, grid, lined grid. Now that's a lot of submenus. Uh, the shortcut is menu 363, uh, I'm sorry, menu 263, um, do that again here, menu 2, 6, and then 3, but nonetheless that will bring up a nice lined grid there for you. Now notice that hole, and I'm going to go back and talk about that on our notes page, there indeed was a hole here, as if you couldn't have determined that before. That hole doesn't show up very nicely on a graphing calculator, unfortunately. But you're going to have to have sort of the, the presence of mind to know that there is something unusual there. All right? So now let's go ahead and try to build a T-chart. And the cool way to do that with the TI Inspire is by the shortcut Control-T. There's other ways to do that, but Control-T for table does a, a great job. And you can see your graph and your table side by side, but there is a problem. Notice in this table, which is now highlighted, which means it's you know, in this bold frame and it's active, so that means you can move the arrow keys and kind of meander about this particular table. You'll notice that the x values are just integers. And that's not very helpful in terms of us trying to put together a chart with these very decimalized x values. So no worries there. We're going to be able to change that. So if the table is highlighted, and it should be, you can then access the menu, which brings up different menu options that pertain only to the table. Use option 2 for table, and then option 5, edit table settings. And the only thing that you're going to want to do here is just change the independent variable, which is your x, from auto to ask. That's basically putting you in a position where you have the freedom to enter the values for x. You don't want to change the dependent, which is the f of x or y values, because by keeping them on auto, you're going to say, calculator, I want you to do all the work. So if you hit OK, you're going to notice that, oh, goodness, everything seems to have disappeared in your x columns. Well, that's what you want. So now you can just type in the values of x. We can go from left to right, starting with 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999. We'll even throw 1 in there and talk about its result. And then 1.001, 1.01, and 1.1. And now we have our nice table. Now, this table is not very difficult to read, being side by side with the graph. But I do want to show you a very nifty little feature that uh, is so wonderful if you want to really focus in on a table. And then perhaps maybe you have multiple columns of the table, uh, more than two columns that, that are a little bit difficult to read in the side-by-side -side view. Uh, my students, this is not listed in your notes, so you might want to pay attention to this. But as long as you're in a document setting, which we are, if you have this table highlighted, and notice it is with the black frame, you can do a really cool shortcut called Control-6. Now you might think, well, what did that do? It made my table disappear. I'm back to my graph screen, full page. Well, notice that there is now another page of the document, 1.2, that you can access by hitting Control-Right. And that page happens to be nothing but the table, so it's just a little bit bigger and easier to see. So now we can answer the question, what does the f of x value here become as the x values get very close to this one? 
Well, <clears throat> notice we can't just let x equal 1 because of the getting the 0 in the denominator. But if we look at these two values, the 2.997 and the 3.003, which are the results of letting some values of x get very close to 1 on either side of 1, we probably can come to the conclusion that our limit is 3. And it is. And, and you would probably want to fill in all of these values in your chart if, the, if that's as part of the instructions of the particular assignment. What I'm going to do is just fill in the two that are close to the one to kind of finish off the notes here. So we'll say uh, we had 2.997, I believe, right here. And I believe the 1.001 .001 resulted in 3.003. .003. And of course, one was undefined. So the simple fact that these two numbers here are very, very, very close to 3 leads us to believe that the answer to this limit most likely is 3. And it is. And I know that it, it kind of causes a student to think, well, how do you know that? You know, what if the answer was 2.99999? Well, that's where we have to investigate a much more formal definition of limit. And we will get to that in a future video. It's called the delta epsilon definition of limit. But for right now, you sort of have to trust your, your faith in the numbers and the fact that they do seem to converge upon this nice value of 3. So hopefully this kind of gets you started with the idea of limits. And uh, we'll see you at the next video.